But why bother to do radio astronomy? What's, what's the point? Every modern astronomy is very much a multi-wavelength enterprise, right? So most modern astronomers who are doing research of one kind or another don't restrict their observing or their study to just visible wavelengths or just radio wavelengths or any other wavelength regime. They typically use a, a very broad set of resources to study whatever they're interested in. That would include radio telescopes and perhaps one of the great, NASA's great observatories in space, the Hubble Space Telescope or the Spitzer Space Telescope, perhaps a ground-based telescope like the Keck Telescope in Hawaii or the Gemini Telescopes in Hawaii and Chile. Um, and the radio telescopes uh, and the ability to look at radio radiation coming to us from objects in space basically gives us a complementary way of understanding what's going on. We basically look at a different set of physical processes when we observe the radio radiation coming to us. So here's a very familiar object, the Horsehead Nebula, a lovely object in uh, Orion. And in the optical, it looks like this. So the red in the background is very hot hydrogen being uh, uh, brought to emission by hot stars in the neighborhood. And the nebula itself is dark. If we move out in wavelength a bit to the infrared, it starts to change what it looks like. And so this is the domain of the Spitzer Space Telescope, for example. And if we go even further out to the millimeter wave radio region, so that we're now looking at radio waves that have wavelengths of about a millimeter or so, this is what the horse head looks like. And so what is completely dark, for the most part, almost entirely dark, in the optical, is now the sole source of the emission. So at millimeter wavelengths, for example, you're looking at essentially the cold universe, right? That very dark cloud that makes this horse head is actually a really dense dark cloud. It's cold. It's only a few degrees above absolute zero, probably somewhere between 10 and 30 degrees above absolute zero. But it's a strong emitter in the millimeter wave radio. And part of what we're going to get, one of the really great things we're going to get from ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, is we're going to be able to image objects like the horse head, these star-forming clouds, not at this kind of bland resolution. Right? There's not much resolution there. There's not much detail, but at that kind of resolution. So we'll, we'll now create millimeter wave images with this kind of arc second-ish or better resolution. And that's an enormous step forward. That's a step forward of a factor of 10 to 100. We also see objects in the radio that are either not visible or difficult to see in other parts of the spectrum, such as pulsars. Pulsars are rotating neutron stars, and neutron stars are one of the endpoints of stellar evolution. So a star collapses at the end of its life into this sort of city-sized object, 20 miles in diameter, enormously dense. Um, a large number of them end up emitting pencil-like beams of radiation. And so these objects are rotating very, very fast, anywhere from a few times per second to up to 1,000 times per second. Right, imagine, imagine a city rotating. Imagine Charlottesville rotating 800 times per second, right? It'd be tough to give the talk. <laughs> and then, but we would try. We would persevere. When these were discovered, many of you probably know the story that these were discovered in the late 60s. And the emission from pulsars is so regular, it's atomic clock regular, that for a little while, the astronomers who first discovered pulsars thought they had ET. And so they were calling the very first pulsar LGM for little green men. And, uh, it wasn't ET. It was actually something even, well, maybe not more interesting, but certainly to astronomers anyway, right? Very interesting pulsars. And uh, pulsars are really best discovered and best understood in the radio. Well, the center of our galaxy has been an object of intense study, and we learn a great deal about it by looking at radio wavelengths. So here is a uh, carefully put together radio image taken at a wavelength of about 90 centimeters by the very large array. This is the center of our galaxy. And you can see this line down here. That's half a degree the width of the full moon. And so this is a pretty fair-sized piece of the galactic plane right here. And there's a lot going on there. Supernova remnants and, of course, the center of the galaxy itself. And you can use telescopes like the Very Large Array to look at the center of our galaxy at a variety of wavelengths. So here's 20 centimeters rather than 90 centimeters and this little piece right here. Or you can look at even higher frequency and begin to see even more structure 
at the very center of the galaxy. And then if you go one step further, you see that guy. That little dot is the rather unceremoniously named Sag A star, which is the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. That's it right there. And radio astronomy, and in particular the very long baseline interferometry technique, really offers the best chance to image a black hole. Right, you've got that little problem of imaging a black hole. And you wouldn't, of course, image the actual black hole, but you would image its shadow. And we're close. We're about a factor of two from, we think, being able to do that. Hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. It constitutes about 75% of the uh, material, well, as the visible material. Right? We have that whole dark matter problem. But let's ignore that for the moment. <laughs> it's only 96% of the universe. We think of dark matter and dark energy. You know, this is astronomy, right? And these you probably recognize, even in these rather um, not very high contrast images. This is Messier 81 at Messier 82 in the optical. And then if we look in the radio, if we look at um, 1.4 uh, gigahertz, this is neutral hydrogen. So here you can see the beautiful spiral structure. And what always fascinates me about this is the way this happens is we have a hydrogen atom, and it has a minute change in the state of the atom. We won't worry about the details, a little quantum mechanics thing. Any given atom will only do that about once every 10 to the ninth years, right? About, what, a billion years or so. So you say, well, that doesn't sound like good odds. And there's all this emission that we see. So if you take an atom, you, an atom of hydrogen, and you set it out there in space, and you watch it, and you're immortal, <laughs> then, you have, then you have 10 to the ninth years before it flips state and gives off one photon, one particle of light as a wavelength of of the radiation that you see here. But the good news, of course, is that there's an enormous amount of hydrogen in objects like these spiral galaxies. And part of what this teaches us, and part of what radio astronomy is teaching us here, is that these are, these are, these are all connected systems. There's M82 up there, and here's M81, and here's NGC Umpty Squat, that uh, is also part of the system. So let's talk about where are we going. Those are some of the things that radio astronomy allows us to see. Of course, there's much more, and that's just kind of a top-level view. But let's talk in brief about these three projects. So here first is the Expanded Very Large Array, which is a very expanded name. So I'm just going to call it EBLA from here on out. And I'm pretty sure that we're going to rename this telescope um, sometime in the future. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh -huh. It needs a glorious name, right? It needs a name like Hull, right? Something <laughs> like that. Of course, of course, we wouldn't use Hull. This is an international project as well. Like many large scientific projects these days, they are beyond the resources of individual uh, nations. And so this is a project that combines resources from the United States, our observatory, our parent organization, and of course the National Science Foundation, who funds the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. The CONACYT, which is the analog to the National Science Foundation in Mexico, and uh, the National Research Council of Canada. So this is a collaboration between, a very North American collaboration, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. I thought we needed a winter picture here, although it's, what, 70-some degrees outside. Got that part wrong. 